Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar today, which we have titled Regulation in Plain Text, FDA and USDA Regulatory Updates and What They Mean to You. We're gonna be send, spending some time reviewing, discussing, and making sense of the latest and upcoming regulatory updates, leaving plenty of time to answer any questions you may have. So first, I'd like to start by reading a brief introduction for each of our distinguished presenters. So Dr. Doug Marshall is the Chief Scientific Officer with Eurofins Microbiology Laboratories. He's also co-founder and director of the Food Safety Institute, technical director of the Refrigerated Foods Association, and Microbiology Task Force Chair for the American Spice Trade Association. Doug has had an extensive teaching career, most recently as Associate Dean and Professor of Public Health at the University of Northern Colorado. He continues to share his knowledge and expertise through over 300 invited presentations and over 100 workshops delivered, as well as a frequent volunteer and consultant to trade associations, government agencies, and private companies. Today, Doug will be providing us with updates and perspectives from the FDA. Welcome, Doug. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. John Skanga, who is Chief Scientific Officer with the Eurofins North American Meat Division. John is also highly active within the scientific community. He has been an author or co-author of over 70 refereed scientific publications on red meat quality and safety, and has presented the findings of his work through numerous invited presentations, both in the US and internationally. In addition to his role with Eurofins, John serves as the current chair of the Colorado Beef Council and is very active in many local groups within his community. Today, John will be reporting and discussing updates from the USDA side. Okay, well, that's it for me. Um, with that, Doug, I'm gonna go ahead and get myself off of here and hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, it is a distinct pleasure to spend some time with you today. Uh, I just have a couple of um, uh, announcements going into this um, webinar. Uh, number one, uh, the information presented here in the opinions expressed are those of the two presenters. So Dr. Skang and I, we do not represent FDA or USDA, and uh, certainly the opinions expressed uh, also may not be reflective of uh, your offense opinion. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, so uh, the first section we're going to uh, scroll through our FDA updates. Now, just remember that uh, the two presenters here um, had abundant amount of uh, information from the regulatory agencies. So don't consider this to be an all-inclusive, most up-to-date um, viewpoint. Rather, these are some items that we think are of interest to our customers, and hopefully the guidance we provide you will help you move through these um, as appropriate to your operations. Next, please. So the first thing I'm going to talk about are some updates on heavy metals. And so FDA put out some guidance information. The first one is on levels of inorganic arsenic in apple juice. And that level is 10 parts per billion. And the reason why FDA chose only apple juice is because the predominant consumer of these products are going to be high-risk individuals, uh, primarily children and perhaps the elderly. Uh, so other food items, there is no regulatory guidance limit on uh, inorganic arsenic, uh, but I think if you want to uh, think about how you are managing this, you know, 10 parts per million is, is a potential target for you. Next, please. A couple of other things have uh, increased regulatory scrutiny over some sectors and primarily related to um, public health issues. So the first one uh, deals with an outbreak associated with uh, lead and perhaps chromium. So there was a brand that was manufacturing applesauce and there were uh, about 400 cases of children who acquired acute lead toxicity consuming this applesauce product. The products were manufactured in Ecuador and the lead was traced to the cinnamon powder that was used in an ingredient in this applesauce product. Uh, during the traceback analysis, 
the cinnamon sticks that were used to make the ground cinnamon did not have lead levels that were uh, at harmful levels. So what is believed is that the processor uh, must have added lead either intentionally or unintentionally uh, to the powder that then was an ingredient into the uh, applesauce. Uh, it's no surprise that the processor of that um, cinnamon uh, has disappeared. Next, please. So why would someone want to adulterate cinnamon powder with a lead? That doesn't seem to be a clever business activity. Well, we know that uh, there is um, um, really no uh, lead action limit from FDA. FAO has an action limit of two and a half parts per million. Um, but because of this outbreak, FDA is now asking manufacturers to do voluntary uh, limits and voluntary recalls anytime they find lead in this, in this product of, uh, above two parts per million. Okay. Um, so what I have here is a picture of powdered cinnamon and a picture of lead chromate, which is a um, component of chrome orange pigment. And we know that uh, uh, color adulteration of spices is not unheard of. And I'll let you think about which of these piles of powder is cinnamon and which of these piles is lead chromium. Next, please. What we also know is that chromium is an essential nutrient. What is not clear is how much is too much chromium uh, in your diet. While we're on artificial colors, uh, looking for some guidance, I went looking for some guidance on how do you uh, use artificial colors and how uh, do you label these. So I found a series of updates from uh, the regulators uh, related to color additives. I want to run through these with you very quickly. So is there a difference between the terms no artificial colors and not artificially colored? And the answer is yes. So uh, there are two kinds of different color categories, those that are subject to FDA certification process and those that are exempt from that certification process. Next, please. So a certified artificial color are those that uh, you are, might be familiar with by their um, um, trade names. So uh, they're listed like FDNC Blue Number One, Blue Two, Blue One Lake. These are all certified uh, artificial colors. And if you use the claim no artificial colors means that none of these synthetic certified colorants are uh, part of the ingredient list. Next, please. A natural color, on the other hand, is a product that's free from artificial colors um, that may contain color additives that are exempt from certification. So these would also be known as natural colors. Some examples include those from plant or mineral sources, things like beet juice, carrot juice, annatto, caramel color, and so forth, that may have other technical functions in the food, such as flavor, but can also be considered color additives when their use results in the alteration of the color of the final product. Okay, next, please. Uh, we also have some other natural colors. This could be some common spices that impart color that includes things like paprika, turmeric, saffron, and their uh, relative extractives. So spices that impart color must be declared as spices and coloring, or something like flavor and coloring. Uh, because uh, unless you have a specific spice or spice extractive that is named by their common or, unusual, or usual name. So for example, if you're adding turmeric as an ingredient, yes, it adds color. It's also there uh, potentially for flavor. Next, please. Um, here's another uh, photograph for you to uh, compare. One of these powder piles is red dye number 40, which would be a artificial certified color. 
uh, compared to beet powder. Next, please. If you use the term not artificially colored, the claim uh, must uh, be free of both artificial colors and natural colors because any color that is added that alters the appearance uh, would be considered to be uh, artificially colored. The labeling must declare that the product is artificially colored as part of a product name qualifier. Uh, some examples would be artificially colored or colored with the colorant. Therefore, a claim of not artificially colors means that no color additive, whether natural and synthetic, has been used to alter or to impart color to a product. Next, please. The term no artificial color, uh, this is where you um, have products with labels that um, include natural color additives but also has a claim that no artificial color okay so you should clearly identify the source of the natural color in the labeling so that the accuracy of the claim can be verified during label approval by uh, the uh, appropriate regulatory authority therefore the claim of not artificially color means that no color additive whether natural or synthetic has been used to impart or alter the color of the product. Next, please. We're gonna turn now to traceability, which is the big boogie uh, person uh, when you are uh, manufacturing uh, foods or ingredients that are part of the food traceability list. If your products are on that list, then you are obliged by law to put together a traceability plan. The compliance date is, is coming up, so a lot of people are dragging their feet on this, and this is uh, potentially going to be a challenge for many food manufacturers. There is a compliance guide published by FDA. I would encourage you to look at that for uh, further advice. Next, please. But if you are just getting started or if you uh, are somewhere in the process and you want additional information, these are a couple of resources that I think are pretty good in helping you jumpstart your traceability plan. Uh, one is uh, GS1, which is the uh, barcoding uh, UR code uh, kind of service provider uh, with their standards. And then uh, the Institute of Food Technologists Global Food Traceability Center also has a wealth of uh, examples. Uh, many trade associations also have published and are freely available uh, things like checklists and case studies and examples that are specific to the sectors that those trade associations um, uh, serve. So please check those out as well. Next, please. Uh, some other regulatory actions that may be of interest to you is FDA uh, issued a, a complete revocation now of the use of partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. Uh, so there were a few food categories that were initially exempt. Those have now been removed. So uh, these are no longer allowed in these products. So peanut butter, fish oil, uh, margarines, uh, rapeseed oil, short bean spreads, rolls, and buns. Next, please. Uh, some FSMA updates beyond traceability. Uh, there are some very important ones that were recently released. This includes an update to Appendix 1, which is really the uh, uh, supplement to uh, companies doing a hazard analysis. So uh, that uh, appendix has been dramatically revised in the guidance um, document. Uh, there are some clarification chapters, uh, so chapter 11 on food allergen programs has been updated, and again, just remember that the leading cause of food recalls is improperly labeling uh, for allergen control, so uh, companies still struggle to get that right, and uh, every week there's a recall from someone who uh, does not properly declare allergens on their labels. There is also clarification of uh, the interaction between the preventive controls for human foods requirements and 
the acidified uh, low acid canned foods requirements. So chapter six details those relationships. And then they uh, finally released the pre-harvest agricultural water final rule. So if that's uh, important to you as a uh, grower or a processor, uh, please make sure you're compliant with those rules. Next, please. Uh, so here are just a couple of examples for uh, some of those updates that I think you should think about. So again, on Appendix 1, they uh, significantly revised the product categories that emphasize the ingredients that go into foods rather than finished products. Okay, And the rationale here is finished products can be a whole mismatch of ingredients from all kinds of different sources. And so FDA's thinking was, let's focus on the ingredients rather than the finished product. So uh, that's a very uh, significant change. Uh, they also replaced a series of tables listing known or reasonably foreseeable process-related hazards. Um, and instead, they've included a, a rather detailed uh, narrative uh, discussing such hazards. They also introduced a new term because people uh, found reasonably foreseeable process-related hazards as uh, rather difficult to understand. And so they're now using uh, the substitute, which is equivalent, a potential hazard. Okay. So just keep that in mind when you see reasonably foreseeable and you see potential in the same uh, document, they're synonymous. Next, please. Uh, they also provided a general discussion of food allergen uh, hazards. Uh, rather than identifying uh, known or reasonably uh, foreseeable food uh, allergen hazards that could apply to multiple product categories. And then they also included uh, technical, scientific, and regulatory information that FDA relied on in identifying some hazards that are potential but less common um, and, and hazards in some other food categories they had previously uh, called out. Next, please. So uh, let's focus uh, quickly on some of the changes for the allergen control program updates. Uh, again, they link the hazard analysis to CGMPs for allergen control. So if you're using labeling as a um, uh, an intervention, so a process-related control, uh, or an activity, there are some things that you could also uh, include in your GMP programs that relates to uh, how you are managing uh, allergen risks. There is a strong expectation on the use of precautionary statements, and there has been a recent uh, warning letter issued to a break bakery, and I'll discuss that in a minute. So FDA is uh, taking strong action for people who just put blanket uh, allergen warning declaration on their labels rather than including them as bona fide ingredients on your ingredient statement. There's more emphasis on cross contact controls, more emphasis on label controls, and more emphasis on supply chain controls because there's not much you can do to remove allergens if you're inheriting uh, a, uh, an allergen that has not been adequately controlled by your suppliers. Next, please. So here's that example on uh, label declaration that FDA uh, called out. So uh, this is a specific example related to sesame because that's the, the newest regulated allergy. Uh, so some manufacturers who make products with sesame uh, and they manufacture products without sesame have decided it was a good idea just to go ahead and list sesame on the non-sesame containing products so that they don't have to do um, an allergen clean between manufacturing different SKUs. Okay. Well, the problem with that is this is very troubling for an allergen sensitive consumer who is used to purchasing products that they know does not contain sesame. They may not be looking at labels that all of a sudden sesame pops up as as part of their ingredient list. And uh, uh, so uh, 
again, this is not a good way to control allergens. And in fact, it demonstrates negligence on behalf of the brand owner, I think, uh, because of that. Next, please. Uh, so not only do sesame sensitive uh, consumers uh, lack awareness of this change, but it also, if you're putting a, uh, an allergen on your label that's not actually in the product, uh, not only are the allergen sensitive individuals not gonna buy your product, but the orbit within their family unit also is no longer going to be purchasing that. That just sounds like horrible marketing to me to scare away uh, potential consumers from a product. And here's the example of the warning letter to a bakery. So in this case, it was Bimbo. And here's, here's the, the language you should think about. So the warning letter simply states that the uh, labels were false or misleading because they included sesame in the ingredient and the contained statements. However, sesame was not an ingredient in that product formulation. So FDA's uh, opinion is that any allergy advisory statement must be truthful and not misleading. Next, please. Uh, some details on the acidified foods update. Uh, the language in this FSMA update really talks in more depth about the relationship between low acid canned foods. So in this case, you're using a thermal process to control microorganisms. And that uh, retort process is your process preventive control. Uh, and it also relates to your preventive control. So if you're also making acidified foods, then pH is your uh, process control, and maybe you do a hot pack as well. Um, but uh, that would make you compliant with that regulation. And, and basically, there's a, a lot of duality going on here. So if you have a food safety plan, uh, this recommendation is you include your acidified foods regulation process control in your food safety plan. Next, please. And so, for example, here's another thing is both uh, regulations have a requirement for monitoring. So in this case, if you're looking at an acidified food, you know, you would want to monitor pH to make sure that the product has been properly acidified for food safety and have those records. Um, and so here's the recommendation is uh, FDA recommends that you add the uh, that form to your food safety plan as part of your written process control for this kind of product. Next, please. Uh, FDA also updated guidance on uh, the nomenclature of seafoods. So in this case, uh, they published the uh, acceptable seafood names list. So it includes a market name, comet name, scientific name, and vernacular name of seafood species that are commonly sold in the US. And uh, they also clarify that vernacular names are not acceptable for labeling. So uh, there's a hot link to that list if you are handling uh, seafood products, make sure you are properly labeling those products with the correct uh, uh, names. Next, please. There are some uh, updates on chemical updates. Uh, some of these are state uh, rules and regulations. So uh, California, for example, uh, banned uh, PFAS, which is a class of fluorinated chemicals in cookware. Uh, FDA proudly uh, announced that PFAS has been removed from grease blocking uh, food packaging. Uh, if you want to think ahead about your chemical control and your hazard analysis, uh, there are 21 chemicals that FDA has announced that are under review. And uh, you might want to look at that list and see if any of these apply to your products or processes. And then FDA released a final rule on revised procedures for assessing food contact substances. So this could be packaging material. It could be uh, perhaps related to processing aids, uh, equipment uh, materials, and so forth. Next, please. So uh, what's coming from FDA? This is by no means a complete list. I think a week or two ago, they updated the list that came after I put this slide deck together. 
but uh, FDA is working on defining healthy, uh, the use of ultra-filtered milk and cheese, the use of salt substitutes, uh, uh, nutritional health claims like uh, soy protein is healthy for your heart and so forth. They're also working on things like uh, front of package nutritional labeling uh, and so forth. Uh, FDA is taking a serious stance against PFAS, and uh, this is an example of an import alert. So if you're importing uh, products in containers that might still have PFAS as a part of their composition, uh, you might be next. Next, please. All right, um, we're going to shift over to Dr. Skanga's presentation. Uh, a reminder that we will entertain questions at the end of uh, of his presentation, so please drop those and I'll talk with you in a few minutes. John? Great, thanks Dr. Marshall, appreciate the update. Uh, one of my key takeaways listening to that is the, some of the similarities between FDA and FSIS and, and there's really um, some pretty strong linkages between uh, what's happening on the food and drug side and what's happening on the meat food safety inspection service side of, uh, of the regulatory environment. So. Um, uh, interesting how they're working and uh it's not hard to to see why there's calls for uh, uh unifying those agencies and, and bringing some of those together um so today from a food safety inspection service perspective uh these are kind of the five areas that i'm going to hit and i'll reiterate uh similar to what doug said this is by no means all inclusive uh just some of the things that over the past few weeks as um, i've traveled to industry meetings and listened to uh, both Paul Kieker and uh, Milo Esteban give regulatory updates from an agency perspective. The things that keep coming up, um, and you can tell are the things that are top of mind for FSIS um, as they look to the future. Um, the first one, obviously, is salmonella, and this has dominated the, the conversation probably for the last two and a half years. And it dates back to the roadmap that was that was actually introduced uh, by Dr. Mindy Brashears when she was the um, administrator, really looking at the roadmap to reduce salmonella. Uh, and that drives from a perspective that that CDC has their Healthy People 2030 and they're actually their 2020 goals. And really, from a food industry perspective, we've we've done very little to move the needle uh, in terms of salmonella illnesses. And so the pressure from a regulatory uh, perspective and on those regulatory agencies to make changes uh, to to drive this outcome, this lagging indicator of, of food safety uh, is what's it, uh, incentivizing those agencies and FSIS to look at it. So the roadmap came out in 2020 um, and some things that have happened since then uh, is they did come out with their salmonella framework uh, that came out in 2022. And there really were three components to that framework. And the first one was addressing salmonella and live birds uh, and live poultry. And that's where they've been focused is, is pretty squarely on the poultry industry uh, with the second step being process control. And then the third being some product um, um, requirements or performance standards or levels. And we actually saw the first one of those um, outcomes of step three of this framework uh, come to fruition in April of this year, uh, where they did uh, identify and, and list salmonella as an adulterant, specifically in a very narrow product window of not ready to eat, not fully cooked, breaded stuffed chicken products. So chicken Kiev, chicken cordon blues, those types of things. Um, and in essence, they, they came out and they said that salmonella, any type of salmonella at a level of one CFU per gram or higher, in this narrow product window was adulterated. And, and really that stemmed from a perspective of, of consumer confusion. A consumer brings this product home, it's par fried, it's breaded, so it looks like it could be cooked, uh, but it very clearly states on the label that it's raw. They pop them in the microwave, they just warm them up and eat them, and, and then they, they end up with salmonellosis. Uh, so uh, again, a very narrow window that was causing some illnesses that they took, took action on. Um, when that came out in April, there was a lot of buzz and a lot of conversation in the industry about, okay, what the one CFU per gram level, is that going to be their target? The fact that they just called out salmonella in general and they didn't call out specific serovars. Um, you know, what direction was the agency going to go for 
their next step, um, which everybody believed was going to be poultry carcasses and comminuted poultry. Um, but but then you also hear, okay, what's coming for the pork industry uh, from a beef industry perspective? Uh, where is the agency going to land on salmonella control in, in those two products? Uh, we got a little bit of clarity of that a few weeks ago. So on July 29th, they they gave us a sneak peek. So they did an advance release of the, the federal notice, the proposed rule that was actually published today um, that basically said that salmonella now um, in in poultry products, so carcasses, chicken parts, ground chicken or turkey, they gave us a level of 10 CFU per gram and um, serotypes of public health significance. So they gave us a two part answer um, for that. And, and so, you know, it gives us a little bit more clarity that it's not just going to be a one CFU per gram, which in essence is a zero, close to a zero tolerance. Uh, if you think about it from a, a detectability perspective, um, so they gave us a little bit of room on that, but then they also, as part of their, their framework where they did convene some, um, some risk assessments to be done, looking at specific serovars and their impact on public health, uh, they have narrowed that down. So in chicken, they've identified enteritis, typomerium, and, and enterica as the, the three that, um, that they will look at as adulterants and then Hadar, Typermerium, and um, Mencken in Turkey. So they've given us some clarity as to what that looks like and what it's going forward. Um, you know, I hate to break out my crystal ball, but um, you know, the odds makers in Vegas, if you look at where they're going to go with pork, where they're gonna go with beef, I, I think we can start to see a little clearer path forward in terms of both level and serovar um, outcome. So I think it gives us something to look at as an industry if we're going to to start addressing this before FSIS uh, poses regulations. And, and I think we should as an industry at least have some information as to what our process is doing, what our product looks like uh, prior to them publishing um, notices in the Federal Register that we need to be looking both at levels and specific serovars of, cover, uh, of public uh, health concerns. So uh, gives us a little bit of clarity on that. Uh, there is a 60-day comment period um, that that uh, started today, so I believe that's the end of October is where that ends. Uh, so if you have questions or concerns or comments on this, uh, the door is open for, for you to participate in the regulatory process uh, and highly encourage you to do that. And if you need help uh, with that, uh, you know, reach out to your trade associations, um, you know, reach out to us. We can help you formulate those those comments uh, so that we get those uh, included in the in the comment period and get those addressed by the agency. Um, very similar on the FDA side, a lot of the focus, if we park salmonella for a little bit, from an FSIS perspective is actually on labeling verification, you know, accurate uh, and transparent labeling activities to consumers. And again, uh, very similar on the food side, if we look at recalls uh, kind of post-COVID, vast majority of those have been labeling related or foreign material related. They have not been microbiological or pathogen related. Um, and, and so there's been this focus by FSIS to go through and look at labeling claims and a lot of the labeling activities uh, and both collect data and take some action in improving that truth and transparency and labeling. Uh, these are just three um, activities that they have in the field right now for their field staff. Um, and they're collecting data on this. So they're looking both at nutrition facts panels and raw ground beef. So that's mainly related to fat content um, and ensuring that, that that's there. And then also sodium um, content on that nutritional panel for just uh, you know raw ground beef. So we got to make sure that we're, we're hitting that and we do have some leeway in terms of fat percentage of what that looks like, but um, making sure we get that uh, dialed in. Uh, the other one is raised without antibiotics and raised without growth promoting claims, both in chicken and in beef. And again, um, the raised without hormones in beef piece uh, and the antibiotics claim, those are kind of driven. If you look historically, there was, um, you know, some things that were published about two and a half years ago where there was some sampling collected and some labeled product and some um, uh, production uh claim labeled type products where they found residues, both of antibiotics and growth promotants, 
um, in products that were labeled as not containing those. And so it kind of forced the agency's hand to address that a little bit and, and ensure that um, activities where you have production-based claim products are doing things to, to ensure that, that that is in fact truthful. Um, this is one of those, and, and this was a follow-up to that um, study that I just mentioned, is FSIS partnered with ARS uh, to go collect some samples. And so they looked at uh, samples of tissues, specifically in cattle. They looked at 180 veterinary drugs, um, and then ARS published that. And the thing that got me, and this was the first thing that I've seen from that, is uh, Dr. Esteban at IAFP in Long Beach, uh, when he was giving his regulatory update, and I haven't seen this published anywhere, but he said on the podium that 17% that of the samples that were collected in that study, uh, they had detectable levels of, of antibiotics and growth promoters. Uh, specifically antibiotics, I believe, was what he was referencing. And it wasn't just detectable levels. He did explicitly say there were both antibiotic levels and some that actually exceeded um, the, the maximum residue level for those antibiotics that are posted by FDA. So it was both detection, uh, but also violative levels in products that were labeled as raised without antibiotics uh, on the label statement. So I think you can see why the agency would be concerned with that. Um, you know, from a production standpoint, I think there is a vast difference uh, between uh, detectable levels and administered levels. And it is very possible to have products that are raised, um, you know, meeting the criteria of no antibiotics administered, uh, but still have some exposure to those in the natural environment and, and, and have detectable levels. So detectability does not necessarily uh, equal administration. And I think we have to be careful with that and understand it. Uh, but if we're definitely seeing violative residues of antibiotics, we can pretty we can draw a pretty solid black line to administration with that. So if, if you are manufacturing or, or uh, marketing products that that are under these types of label claims, um, whether it's it's natural, raised without antibiotics, raised without growth hormones, whatever the case may be, um, I think it's important that you you take a step back and you look at your programs, you look at your producer affidavits. You look at your on-farm um, auditing protocols and whether those are third party and independent or first party um, and just go back and do your diligence on those and look and make sure you've got everything in place uh, that your producers that are signing those affidavits um, have good record keeping you know make sure you have that trust and then really i think what the agency is looking for um, is they're looking for some level of verification on the back end and they haven't gone so far as to regulate that but they've mentioned it several times that if you've got finished products, they would really like to see some verification testing on the back side of those um, to support your, your efforts up, upstream. Um, on, the, on the trend with labeling products, so the products of US origin claims, country of origin labeling, um, you know, this has been one of those Ferris wheels that's gone around. We had country of origin labeling, we lost some. Uh, court cases with WTO and they pulled that back and then it kind of opened it up to, to any product that basically was opened or processed or further further processed in the U.S. Um, could be labeled with product of the USA. And that's the current state of affairs today uh, is if you're bringing in imported raw materials and you grind those or you purvey them, uh, further process them, you still can label them as product of the USA. And you can see where uh, consumer groups um, and advocates said, hey, um, you know, we don't believe that's very truthful. We're, not, we're, we're really not conveying to the consumer uh, where that product originated. Um, and then our industry gets very complex. So, you know, at what level do, it does it become a product of the U.S.? And, and FSIS in May came out and they said, okay, what we're going to say is if you want to put these voluntary, again, very key that it's voluntary, you don't have to put an origin claim on a label. But if you choose to do so, uh, and you want it to say product of the U.S., that, that that product has to be derived from animals born, raised, and slaughtered and processed in the United States. So they have provided that definition, that clarity of what that means. It is voluntary, and then it gives us an implementation date of January 1st, 2026. So if you have those statements on your label, again, uh, they're going to want to see that 
that the products that you're you're putting under that label meet that requirement. Um, I do anticipate that you know the Canadians and uh, uh, Mexicans have not been you know received that with open arms, and so there's been a lot of discussion both with the trade uh, and with the regulators of what that means from a, a trade perspective with those countries. You know, referencing back to the last WTO case of of is you know is that an arbitrary barrier? Um, so I don't know that this is perfectly settled yet at this time, but it, it has been implemented and there's an effective date of January 1st, 2026. Uh, very similar to FDA, uh, allergen verification. So FSIS is starting to do some verification sampling. Uh, they're focused on the big 14. Uh, they haven't thrown sesame into that yet, but they are intending to do so. They're developing sampling programs for that. Uh, but again, this goes to those products, as Dr. Marshall mentioned, if we've got products that are labeled as free from um, uh, an allergen, uh, they're doing some verification testing to make sure that the control of that is, is accurate uh, and effective and, and ensuring that that labeling is, is true and the consumers can have trust in that. So they are working on that and sampling it. Um, you know, if you don't deal with allergens in your environment, uh, probably nothing to worry about there. Um, violative chemical residues. So this is from a slaughtering uh, establishment perspective. Uh, your HASA plan, you have to address chemical hazards. So that could be pharmaceuticals, it could be pesticides, herbicides, etc. You have to assess those and address those in your HACCP plan uh, as chemical hazards. Uh, and so they're going to want to make sure that you have acknowledged those in your hazard analysis. Um, and then ensure that you have some things in place that if there are problems, uh, that you have the ability to, to track those back and look at uh, uh, implementing effective correct, corrective actions. So that would th be things like identification of animals, uh, a mechanism to notify suppliers, uh, purchasing programs, uh, and again, your voluntary residue avoidance programs, so natural or label type things. Uh, and they even go so far as to throw that fourth bullet point out there of explore live animal testing. And, um, you know, I think that's one that everybody kind of uh, shies away from and gives a little bit of side eye to. But but it's one that the agency has put out there and said, hey, don't don't uh, don't discount this as something that me, we may want to see that you do that in your in your process. Um, and then they also want to um, have additional support for your HACCP plan. So if you do say that your chemical residues uh, uh, or chemical hazards are not likely to, uh, reasonably likely to occur, um, and I chuckled a little bit during Dr. Marshall's presentations because you know uh, FDA has got um, probable and uh, different language for not reasonably likely to occur, but it's in essence the same, same definition of, of the hazard. Uh, but if you say it is not reasonably likely to occur, they want to see things like third-party certification programs or audits, treatment records or affidavits for those types of things. And then if you do say that it is a, a hazard that's likely to occur, they do want you to have a critical control point in your HACCP plan for it. Um, and that's where they're going to want to see some residue testing come forward. So, um, you know, they, they keep alluding to this, this residue testing um, aspect when we're talking about whether it's pharmaceuticals uh, or other chemicals that, that could be hazards likely to occur. Um, one that has been out there on the, the street for about the past 18 months, and this was a guidance that was put out um, uh, in 2022, October of 2022, and it really deals with a very narrow uh, category of products, and that's the, the ready-to-eat fermented uh, and dry-cured products and those that, that don't use cooking is the final lethality step. So again, a very narrow window and a specific window of products. And, and I chuckle because this guideline and it states right in it was put out to deal with small and very small establishments that manufacture these types of products. Um, but that guideline has been one that's been very important. And, and these products have, have been a challenge, not just for the small and very small, but for the large and very large that manufacture things like salamis and prosciuttos and copas and, and those wide variety of very artisan dry cured and salted uh, meat products. But it, it gives some very specific guidance um, to how these products need to be uh, assessed from a food safety perspective. 
and, and really gives two validation requirements that you have to look at if you're manufacturing these. So you have to address um, outgrowth of staph and clostridiums. Um, you know, again, these are products that uh, we're going to ferment either with or without, um, you know, added starter cultures or directly acidified. Um, and so we're going to have a process that that it subjects these products to, um, you know, temperatures for fermentation. So obviously conducive to bacterial outgrowth, uh, but we also want to control these pathogens and whether we control them with salt or cure salt or nitrites or, or however we're controlling those, we need to validate that our formulation and our process um, doesn't result in outgrowth of Staph aureus or Clostridium perfringens or botulinum, which both can be uh, pretty problematic from a food safety standpoint. Uh, in addition to controlling that outgrowth, they also want you to validate your process for pathogen reduction specific to the raw materials that you're using. So, uh, for instance, if you've got a pork salami product, um, you need to demonstrate a five log reduction of salmonella. Uh, if it's a beef containing product, you have to include shigatoxin producing E. coli. Uh, both of those, any, any raw meat product, you have to control listeria uh, and show a two log reduction of that and then control of trachina and pork products. So it's not anything that we probably haven't thought about and there's a lot of growth models and prediction models both from a, a time and temperature perspective from a staff outgrowth um, perspective and trachina control. Uh, but where the industry is running into trouble with this is making sure that the individual and tailored processes that we use to manufacture these products fit the parameters of what the published models or the published literature tells us. And because they're such artisan products and the nature of these, uh, very few manufacturers have a process that fit into those, those prescribed uh, parameters. And so in essence, um, a lot of producers are having to do their own validations of their specific product and processes. And the struggle with that is they have to be uh, inoculated validation studies. So you have to do those in laboratory. You can't do them in plant. Um, and so there's some challenges that go that, that come with doing those validations. Um, and, and one of the big problems with that is, you know, if you send it off to the laboratory to do these, um, you're, you're really giving an artisan meat product to um, a laboratory environment to try to have them recreate that. So. Um, there's some challenges in doing that, and um, I'll give a little plug here that, that we're excited to announce that we're opening our uh, biosecurity level two facility in Lafayette, um, where we're going to be able to make these, and we've, we're have we putting some equipment in, and we're excited to cut the ribbon on that facility. So if you make these products um, and you need some validations done, um, we're, gonna, we're set up to do that and can provide that service for you. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is, is uh, HACCP-based inspection models, and, and this isn't new. The poultry modernization guidelines have been out for 10 years now, um, and by and large, um, all of your large and very large poultry processing establishments have moved to modernized inspection protocols. Um, swine is in the same guidance. Uh, beef has really lagged behind a little bit on that for a multitude of reasons, but um, if we look, they have been issuing waivers, and there are some very large beef processing establishments that are running running under a HACCP-based inspection models project. And, and I bring this up because what we've heard from the agency um, as they've talked about these HIP models of inspection is both the fact that, that they are supported by science and they have been implemented effectively and they see very positive outcomes from this. Uh, they see a, a relationship building activity between the processor and the, the industry and the uh, agency. Um, but the other thing the agency is dealing with, just like all the rest of us, uh, is a shortage of labor. Uh, and they are not, uh, they are not very uh, coy when they say that FSIS is dealing with that. They're dealing with budget constraints and labor constraints. And they really see, especially with this last wave of infrastructure uh, expansion and the number of new plants that have been brought online post COVID and what we see in the future that they are going to be strapped for resources. Uh, and, and I believe the terminology that they've used is it's not if, but when they're going to ask you to uh, 
uh, move to this type of modernized inspection. And so they are actually encouraging uh, uh, processors that that do slaughter beef to go ahead and file a waiver and apply for this now in advance. And I think it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to control your own destiny as to how this is going to be implemented in your uh, establishment. And that's kind of before they get to a point where they're going to change their their entire uh, outlook on inspection and go to these types of models. And then it's going to be told to you how you're going to do it. So, so would encourage those of you that um, that do slaughter beef um, and, and are a single species slaughter to to probably take a look at that and start exploring um, this HACCP based inspection model project. Start looking at what the resources are need and the SOPs and the training because it is a pretty intensive process to go through in terms of employee training. Um, and there's some good resources that are out there um, to, to help you with that. And if you need help with that, certainly reach out to us and we can provide some, some, uh, some guidance. The question I have is if you look at the very small uh, establishments and those that are doing multi-species in plant, um, you know, how this is gonna roll into a multi-species uh, environment and what that looks like. And I don't think the agency's really gotten there or addressed that yet. So um, with that, um, just again, I'll give you a quick reminder that that uh, these are Doug and I's opinions and these are our interpretations of what we've, we've heard and we've read um, and that do not represent the uh, opinions or the uh, uh, views of either FDA or FSIS. So uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions and uh, thank you very much for your attendance and we appreciate it and certainly reach out if we can be of further assistance. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Skanga, Dr. Marshall. Um, do you have a few questions that come in? Um, as we get into the questions, I'm gonna throw up a couple polls um, for you to kind of think about and consider as your, as your questions are, are coming out. So I'll throw those up on the screen here. So Dr. Skanga, I guess I'll go back to you. Um, you started at the beginning when you talked about um, the rules coming out in Salmonella. Um, as companies prepare for these the Salmonella testing, um, what are some testing considerations that they should be thinking about or how to apply it into their facility? What, what sort of testing options are there out there? Sure. Talk a little uh, bit about that. Yeah, so again, because we're dealing with a, a, a regulatory framework that is both uh, quantification, but also serotyping. You have to look at both of those aspects of it, uh, and and those have changed. And you have to do that in the speed of commerce. So I think if we if we rolled the, the clock back and we went to traditional methodologies, you know, we have the ability to do both of those, but they they take days to get to the answer that we're looking for. Um, so if we look at rapid methodologies and PCR based technologies to answer those questions, it's a relatively new space and doing quantitative PCR. Uh, there are some commercial things that are out there for us to use. Um, and so we have those tests that are available from a quantitative PCR perspective. And then also, um, you know, we have the ability to do serotyping um, of those now in a, in a straight package that have those specific four for poultry and the specific uh, three for turkey. We don't have that packaged up, so they are actually individual. Um, but we do have the ability to do those and work with that. So again, I would say we have the testing capabilities that are there. I think it's a new frontier. Um, you know, at IAFP, we saw a lot of posters, a lot of information that was presented kind of on new testing technologies that address specifically the salmonella uh, environment. Um, so I, I anticipate that's going to be a space that's going to evolve rapidly um, and add to the toolbox that we have available today. And I don't, Doug, if you want to comment on that too, you're actually a microbiologist. I just pretend to be, so. <laughs> no, you, your answer was spot on. So let us know what you need and we'll do our best to deliver um, a service offering that uh, meets your expectations. All right. Thank you for that. Um, well, I guess, uh, uh, Dr. Marshall, kind of going back to the beginning of your presentation you talked a little bit about arsenic and apple juice um, so the question here is that a, does that apply to apple cider um, as well um, what about hard or alcoholic um, apple ciders as well well you have to think about that um, that regulatory posture is really related to um, apple juice and apple sauce that is destined for a high-risk consumer so this would be children 
Uh, now, in the fermentation process, to be able to go from a, uh, a soft apple juice to a hard cider, um, the question you might ask is, is that going to remove uh, arsenic? Uh, but mostly what you're thinking about here is source control. I mean, we're not adding arsenic as an ingredient to these products. These are just coming from apples from orchards that have a history of arsenic use as a growth promoter. And it gets in the soil, it persists in the soil, some of it gets into the apples, and when the apples get pressed. So your control of this is, is primarily related to the source of the apples, not really uh, what you can do during processing. So um, it's up to you to make the distinction whether or not you believe that this ruling applies to other kinds of apple products um, and whether or not uh, you have the ability to control arsenic in those products. Perfect, thank you. All right, so um, kind of uh, sticking with you a little bit here, Doug. Um, one of the, the updates that was not discussed was the FDA sodium reduction goal. Um, and as companies are planning to reduce sodium levels in their products, uh, can you talk a little bit about the food safety concerns that they might look out for or considerations there? Yeah, well, John brought up the uh, fermented dry cured sausage category. Um, and we know that there was, I think, at least one outbreak where those were reduced sodium products. So sodium controls the water activity of foods. And if that is a process preventive control and you go down the, the lane to try and reduce sodium in those products to try and meet these sodium reduction goals, uh, don't forget that there is a food safety component that uh, may turn out to be out of control just simply by changing the amount of sodium in, in your product. So again, it's gonna be very product and process specific, uh, whether or not you can make safe products uh, if salt is important for you as a preventive control. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. And that goes to that nature of customization of those types of products, that if you do change the formulation um, and you, your parameter, either your salt content, um, you know, for, for controlling outgrowth, if that changes, um, you know, you need to demonstrate and validate that that process with that salt level and your process does control outgrowth of, um, you know, specifically staff or clostridials where you're using salt as that control agent. Perfect. Thank you. So with that, again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Marshall, Dr. Skanga for your presentations, your insights, perspectives today, and thank you all for attending. <laughs>